Victor's worked with JPL for nearly 20 years on the Pioneer Anomaly and other research related to general relativity and gravitation. Uh, together with Slava Turyashev, who couldn't be here, but we, um, uh, we're, we're very glad to have Victor here. Uh, Victor played a key role in exploring the solar gravitational lens, which we've heard about so far today, capabilities, limitations, and possible use for high-resolution exoplanet imaging. So his title I should be on screen, I hope, is Look Before You Leap. So, Victor, <laughs> over to you. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, and I hope you don't mind that I presented an extraterrestrial. Everybody knows cats are extraterrestrial spies, and they probably look before they leap, <clears throat> and they are known to be good leapers. So the reason why I chose that title is because we are talking about reaching places that are in other solar systems. And I believe other speakers already mentioned that the distance scales here are absolutely enormous. I sometimes use this comparison that imagine that he, somebody is holding up a, a large beach ball on the other side of a standard sports field, like a soccer field or a baseball field or something. And that beach ball is like about this big, and it's so hot that even across the field, it actually burns your face, the heat. You hold up a grape and you hold up a peppercorn. That's the earth and the moon. And the next solar system doesn't fit anywhere on the surface of the earth on this scale because it would be 30,000 kilometers away. So that's, that's the incredible challenge that, uh, that, uh, that we are looking at when we look at other solar systems. So this is why it makes sense, if we can, to actually study them from a distance before we contemplate going there using technologies that are not yet quite available. So the thing that I've been working on, of course, uh, for the last several years is one of the ways of looking at uh, distant solar systems and studying exoplanets in other solar systems. Why is it so hard to look? Well, there are three challenges. The things are dim, the things are small, and there's a lot of light contamination. And it is these challenges that, that need to be addressed by any attempt to look at distant solar systems. And I start with the, what we call the tyranny of the diffraction limit. When you take a telescope, its diffraction limit is defined by, <clears throat> sorry, by lambda over d. And that basically tells you what the, what the possible resolution of that telescope is. And uh, astronomers, of course, know that it's, 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 <laughs> it's horribly horrible when you, when you, look, at, when you look, at, look at extended objects like, like stars or planets. It's very, very difficult to image them. So uh, to resolve features, on, say, 10 kilometer scale, we need a telescope that's bigger than the Earth. And perhaps there is a, there is a possibility that maybe we can use long baseline, but long baseline, even if it were possible to do long baseline astronomy using optical telescopes on 10,000 kilometer scales, then there's a the second problem that there's not enough light. So it would take enormous amounts of time to image uh, things using, using even like a, with a 10,000 uh, kilometer baseline uh, system. So the sun comes to the rescue. That's Albert Einstein's notebook, I believe, and the, one of the original announcements of the famous Eddington uh, expedition from 1919, when they showed that, uh, that indeed uh, the sun bends the light the way it is predicted by general relativity. And uh, that basically opens us the path to this, which is the solar gravitational lens. And it has already been, uh, Claudio kindly discussed it uh, briefly, I believe. Uh, it, uh, there is a possibility that we can use the entire sun as a telescope. And of course, the main reason why we want to do that is because the sun is big. So it collects a lot of light. And that's the promise that, uh, that the solar gravitational lens might work to our advantage. However, it is very, very difficult to form a useful image using the solar gravitational lens. I have this slide when I'm, where I'm comparing what the sun projects as to what an artist's impression of what we would see, but the artist's impression is really not to scale. 
The sun projects a very, very blurry image of a distant object. And to give you a scale, if that was the Earth 100 light years away, in the solar gravitational lens focal region, you would see an image that would be about one to one and a half kilometer wide, a projected image. So if you could have a gigantic, gigantic movie screen, you would actually see the sun project an image onto that movie screen with caveats that I'm going to mention in a moment. But if you go there and you don't have a several kilometer wide uh, movie screen, then you're looking at the sun and all you see is the big, very bright sun surrounded by the solar corona, by the way. And through the solar corona, you see an extremely thin and extremely faint Einstein ring if you happen to be lined up perfectly with the, with the source, with the planet that you are studying. And now you can start moving around in the, in the focal plane of the solar gravitational lens to try and build an image. So the image has to be reconstructed. And that reconstruction time is, that, uh, that reconstruction effort is very, very difficult. First of all, for basically for every pixel in the image, you need to go there with a spacecraft and collect light at that pixel. And if you want to do a high resolution image of an exoplanet, then at every pixel location in that multi-kilometer wide image plane, you need to collect light. And you're collecting light from something that's not standing still. Everything is moving. The extra, extrasolar planet is rotating, orbiting. The sun is wobbling because it's being pulled around by all the other planets in the solar system. So your lens is wobbling around and you need to follow that. And you need long exposure times because there's still plenty of light contamination. And you need very precise station keeping. I'm going to dwell on these subjects in a moment, but let me, ask, uh, uh, let me address the other problem that has already been discussed here kind of extensively, I, I suppose. Getting to the solar gravitational lens, um, it's very, very far away. 650 astronomical units is pretty much the minimum distance that we have to be at in order to be able to cover out the sun with a coronagraph so that we can actually get a chance to see the solar gravity, the, 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 the Einstein ring around the sun, the Einstein ring due to a faint source like an exoplanet. So going back to the imaging challenge, the first challenge is signal to noise. And the reason I mentioned signal to noise is the biggest enemy is the solar corona. An exoplanet is a very faint thing. It's not an emitter of light. It just reflects light from its host. The solar corona is about 100,000, close to 100,000 times brighter. So we need to detect a very faint variation of light on that extremely bright background. Now, the farther we are from the sun, the better off we are because the, uh, the Einstein ring of a distant target essentially decreases uh, by the square root of distance from the sun as opposed to the image of the sun itself that decreases uh, 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 the size of which is inverse to the distance from the sun. So it would be better to go to 900, 1200 AU, 2400 AU, even better. But of course, those distances are even, even, even harder to reach than 650. 650 seems to be pretty much the barest minimum that, uh, that uh, we have to be away from the, uh, from the sun to be able to form... Uh, useful images with useful signal-to-noise ratios. And the, the signal-to-noise ratio doesn't end with just a, a light contamination from the corona. There is also light from the host star itself, because the host star will still show up as two pretty bright images, a primary and a secondary image on both sides of the sun due to gravitational lensing. And there may be other sources behind the, 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 that solar system, so we need to be able to both map these sources and also subtract them from... from uh, from, uh, from the useful light. So, the other thing is, sorry, the other thing is that one of the best ways to deal with noise, especially stochastic noise, is collecting light for a long, long time. But we can't really collect light for a long time because uh, everything moves. So there is a tremendous navigational challenge, and also we need to understand exactly how everything wobbles around. And uh, then there is the problem that the solar gravitational lens is not a very good lens. The solar monopole, I mean, the reason why we can choose our focal distance is because the sun doesn't really focus light quite well. It doesn't have a focal point, it has a focal half-line that starts at 548 AU. 
it is it has severe spherical aberration <clears throat> and um, that's why if you are there you don't actually see light fill the lens you only see a thin circle exactly what you would see if you had like a, an, an optical lens that has spherical aberration so it doesn't focus light well if you look through that lens at the at a point source you would see a, a, a thin circle of light through that lens so um beyond spherical aberration the sun is also not a perfect sphere and as it is not a perfect sphere uh the result is that uh, that we have even more mixing up of light all the light is still there all the light that comes from the source is still in that image plane it just gets completely mixed up so it has to be deconvolved and the sad part about deconvolution is that deconvolution has this very nasty property that when we deconvolve the light the useful signal stays what it is but noise gets amplified basically this is stupid uh, bas basically uh, what happens is that um, if you look what happens light gets mixed up from uh, like let's say 1000 10000 100000 million pixels into a million pixels in the image plane so imagine a big matrix of million by million elements in, a per, in the case of a perfect lens, this would be the identity matrix, an exact mapping of source to, 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 to image. In reality, what we have is, well, a slight excess of numbers along the main diagonal and then random numbers everywhere else in that matrix. Those random numbers all pull in noise when you deconvolve. So you, get up, you end up with a tremendous amplification of noise. So sometimes you actually have to wonder, am I better off, you know, just leaving the image blurry as opposed to trying to deconvolve it and ending up with so much noise that the resulting deconvolved image is useless. So then there is the moving target. The uh, problem is that that exoplanet is not going to stay still. We only have minutes to observe a pixel before it rotates too much so there is motion blur. And then on the longer scales, it, rota it, it rotates, its illumination changes because it's in different positions around its orbit, around its whole star. It may even have surface changes, like if it is the Earth, it would have seasonal changes like ice cover, uh, vegetation. So all of that has to be taken into account when, when we look at the possibility of reconstructing useful decent resolution images of exoplanets. And in fact, this is one of the one of the pieces of work that I've been working on most recently, and it, this was only put, uh, put on the archive just a few weeks ago, namely uh, the an attempt. This is this really is my first attempt to combine the gravitational lens of the sun uh, with a moving target. Of course, I use the Earth as a stand-in for that moving target, but this is the Earth as you can see in the upper left. That's the map of the surface of the Earth's cylindrical projection. The one to the right of that is that same map under realistic illumination on a particular day, you know, any day of the year. The lower left is what the sun projects. That blurry thing, that's what the sun projects. So if you had absolute perfection and you had a gigantic movie screen, that's the projection that you that you would see on that on that movie screen, and of course everything else, all the noise, everything else comes on top of that. The lower right, of course, is what you would like to see, but we don't get that. So here's the thing. Now look at the upper right corner. That image doesn't look very impressive, but it was reconstructed from about six thousand observations, and I think that being able to reconstruct that kind of surface map from 6,000 observations in the simulation over the course of several weeks, I think that speaks for itself, that it is in principle possible to reconstruct a good quality surface map of an exoplanet using a realistic number of realistic observations. So I'm actually quite excited about that because this is the first time that we're able to combine the optics of the solar gravitational lens with the dynamics. So this is, you know, like, unless you have seen our, 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 our manuscript on the archive, this really is the first time that I have a chance to talk about it. So beyond that, there is a second question of how to get there. And well, you know, one of the reasons I like this slide is because it shows that the sun has a shadow. Now, you don't think of the sun as something that casts a shadow, but if there's something behind the sun, you won't see it. The sun is opaque. You don't, see, you, don't get, you don't get to see that light. So the thing is, however, when you take the proposed trajectory, which in our case, you know, the, 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 the idea that has been 
put forth is to use a, 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 a solar sailcraft to get to the solar gravitational lens focal region, you will never enter that shadow. And why is that good? Because that means that you can always keep the host star that you're aiming for in sight. So you always have the means to navigate to the right spot because, of course, you know, like I believe Claudio calls it the, 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 the focal sphere. Any direction 650 astronomical units away from the sun is a focal, a focal region for something that happens to be on the opposite side of the sun. But you want to be in the right place so that the actual target that you are looking for is the one that's on the opposite side of the sun. So you can actually keep that target in sight throughout your mission. So you don't have to search for it. You know what it is. You know what you're aiming for. And you basically want to intercept the optical axis of that target at 650 AU and then stay on that line uh, for however long um, it takes to complete the mission. And you can continue to recede from the sun. In fact, things get better as you do because then, again, you know, the, the, ang the actual separation, the relative separation between the solar disk and the, and the, and the Einstein ring will continue to increase. So, but you have to deal with this insane navigational challenge because the uh, projected image moves around like crazy. The exoplanet is orbiting its own sun, well, the barycenter of its own sun and the planet itself. Uh, its own sun is being yanked about possibly by other planets, just, like, just as our sun is being yanked, yanked about. Our sun wobbles around by up to a million kilometers back and forth. And that means that the image that it projects at 650 AU will also wobble around. Okay, the time scales are long. We are talking about several years, like Jupiter orbit. But still, the problem is that the image is not only moving, it's non-inertial movement. So you have to follow it using thrust, using, using acceleration, because it's an accelerating image that moves around. And the problem with that is that, again, I mentioned the projected image may be a couple of kilometers wide. If you want to scan it, you need to know where you are within that image with meter level precision. Now, let's be realistic here. There is no meter scale navigational accuracy at 650 AU. It's not going to happen. However, if we can find what we are looking for, well, I think I lost something. Sorry about that. I, I, I lost. Uh, yeah. Okay. No. If we can, if we can find what we are looking for, then we can zero in on the on the image uh, or images, and and eventually use what we see as our main navigational aid. And this is an actual simulation of what we would see as we would approach the focal line, getting closer and closer to the sun. First, you just see in the left left hand side, you see. Basically one image, because the secondary image of the, of the distant star is still hidden by the sun, which is indicated by the yellow circle. Eventually, both images emerge, and they continue to get, to get amplified. As we get closer and closer, now this is on a different light scale, because otherwise it would be too, too bright. As we get closer and closer, that image actually expands into a full Einstein ring. So we would know where we are. We would know from optical navigation exactly where we are with respect to the projected light from the host star. And if you know the geometry of the distant system, we know what to do next and how to get to the projected image of, it, of the exoplanet and essentially repeat the same procedure using much fainter light. And um, eventually we have to find that exoplanetary image that's about a kilometer in size. And one possibility is to use a constellation of spacecraft as opposed to a single spacecraft. And the reason why I was kind of suggesting that idea is that a constellation of spacecraft could involve spacecraft that are flying completely inertial. And what, the reason why that's good is because if you have an inertial spacecraft, that means it can establish a local inertial reference frame. We know the dynamics of the system. So even though we don't have precise navigation with respect to the Earth, because the DSN is not going to navigate us at one meter precision at 650 AU, once we know where the image is, and we can track our motion with respect to a local inertial reference frame, we can continue to have knowledge of where we are within that wobbly moving image throughout the entire campaign. And that's how, that's how we are able to, that's how we will be able to get uh, to the right region. Uh, uh, sorry, I should have shown this, uh, this slide. Uh, that's how we are able to get to the, to the right, uh, right region, uh, complete our, our, our um, establishment of a local reference frame and, and, and uh, eventually start the campaign, but there's still the question of how to get there.
And that's the really the last topic. And I'm not really an expert on that. I've, I've kind of participated in some of the discussions. The proposed idea at the present is to use sun divers. Sun diver is a, a sun diver is a fancy name given to solar sailcraft that fly very close to the sun, somehow survive the heat, and then uh, get a tremendous acceleration from articulatable solar sails to reach the necessary uh, egress velocity to get to the uh, focal region in, in maybe 25 years. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side is one of my own simulations, actually, because I wanted to see how hot these things can get. So I put in some realistic parameters for, for um, reflectivity and infrared emissivity and all that. And it is actually plausible because one of, the re one of the things is that one of these sun divers will only spend a few hours that near the sun because the orbit is so, so, so quick. So maybe it is survivable. I don't know. I actually like the fusion drive concept. It gets there much faster. And the other thing is we still need a meter scale telescope that, uh, that is very hard to assemble in space from tiny things that would be flying on, multi on a multitude of solar sailcraft. But still, the this, this, this sun diver is, is, uh, is being taken seriously, and I know people are looking for funding for, uh, for a, a precursor mission a, a technology demonstration. So that's that, except that a 40-year 40, 40 mission also raises tremendous technical challenges, and uh, simply to survive that long. And I kept asking people, you know, like, hey, we want artificial intelligence. How is that flash memory going to do after 40 years? Or how is that laser going to do if you do laser communication? So 40 years is not a joke. I mean, yeah, pioneers survived, voyagers survived, but look at the technology they were carrying. So we have to be very careful as to what technology can survive. Also, things like communication. We need to be able to beam back a lot of data from that, to, from that region in order to apply different image deconstruction uh, strategies here, here on the Earth. We can't rely on the spacecraft doing that. So that means you want to beam back as much raw data as possible. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Here's another extraterrestrial who is awaiting your questions. You mentioned that multiple times that the navigation is a significant challenge. So can you please elaborate on how we can overcome that. I know you mentioned the inertial spacecraft, but like, how, what does that entail? Okay, the way I would envision it, launch, all standard stuff, going around the sun, let's say we do this sun diver, we are on an approximate trajectory to intercept the optical axis of the exostar at the given time, 650 AU from the sun. So let's say we are within a million kilometers. So as we approach the optical axis, we have continuous view of the exostar. We know where it is with respect to the sun. We know when it approaches the sun. We will see it when the secondary image emerges on the other side of the sun due to, due to gravitational lensing. So simply by following the light, we can get to within a few thousand kilometers. And then we actually start looking at the formation of the Einstein ring. And as the Einstein ring forms and becomes more uniform, we know that we are really approaching the focal, focal region. So with that, we can get Pretty, pretty precisely to the focal line of the exostar. Now, the next step, once we, once we know where the exostar's image is, presumably at this time, we already have very good knowledge of the target system, so we know where the exoplanet's projected image would be relative to the exostar in that image plane. So now we blind navigate, you know, like that, reckoning to that approximate region, looking again for the emergence of a primary and secondary image eventually for the Einstein ring of the exoplanet. And once we see that, and it's going to be very difficult, I, I, I would, no question about it, but once we see the Einstein ring of the exoplanet emerging, we know that we are either very near or inside the projected image of the exoplanet. We can make repeat observations at this point to pretty much establish where we are now. Here's the thing. We can be off by a couple of hundred meters. That basically means that instead of getting the projected image exactly that center, it will be shifted. What we are not allowed to do is once we establish where we are, we need to maintain it consistently so that when we think that we collect light, let's say from the Earth image from North America, that light is actually coming from North America, not from Greenland. So we need to know where we are in that projected image relative to our initial established position. And this is where the idea of using inertial spacecraft can come in. Because if we understand the dynamics of the entire system, exosystem and uh, uh, our own solar system, and we have a spacecraft in the local vicinity that is flying inertial, then 
that spacecraft can help as essentially a local GPS, a local navigational beacon. And it allows us to track our motion with meter scale precision with respect to that inertial scale system, inertial system. Thank you. And you mentioned that there's only a few minutes like of a window to do this. So is this all done in a few minutes? No, no. The navigation, we have plenty of time to do the okay. navigation. A few minutes is once you start imaging that exoplanet, if it's like the Earth, it rotates. Yeah. If you want 10 kilometer scale images, you don't want that surface feature to move mo more than a few kilometers due to planetary rotation. And that's just basically a few minutes. Almost. Okay. Thank you. Once you're there, um, you're not going to slow down and stop. No. So how how long do you get useful uh, observation time before you run out of range? Or... Thousands of light years. Oh. The focal, <laughs> the focal half line never ends. Okay. Uh, actually, it does eventually because of the way optics works. But that's like oh, I think a hundred million light years or something. <laughs> right. I looked at this problem with Claudio decades ago. And I think from my own research and published work on it, that you need to have an additional drive for cross-range maneuvering when you're out there. And the only thing that I could think of, and maybe there are others, the only one that can be miniaturized sufficiently enough, I think, is the radioisotope electric drive. And that may be because you're not going to just... I, I once approached a trajectory engineer with Marshall and I told him what the um, requirements were. You have to hit one kilometer after 20 billion, 50 billion kilometers, and his eyes sort of glazed over, so. Yeah. You're absolutely right that we need to have lateral navigational capability. No, but the beauty of the problem is that we don't need to go scan line by scan line. We don't need to be where we want to be, we need to know where we are. So, so long as we are within the image, and we know where we are, then uh, we can collect and use that light. Hello. Uh, Bill Higgins, Fermilab? Yes, here. Uh, <laughs> yes, the, the, uh, you're, you're investigating solar gravitational lens and exoplanets as targets. Is there another person or a team thinking about other objects in the cosmos to look at with this technique or uh, uh, do, you, do you have another paper on galaxies or what have you? Uh, we don't have any papers, but we certainly looked at other possibilities. The reason why the exoplanet uh, target came up is, well, first of all, it's in many ways one of the more challenging targets, but also it's also one that, that brings rewards in a sense that, that it might lead to a fundable mission, et cetera, et cetera. So if we just propose, hey, let's use the solar gravitational lens to study a distant galaxy, who is going to fund a 45-year-old, uh, 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 a 45-year mission? On the other hand, let's say somebody tomorrow discovers unambiguous signs of, of biomarkers on an exoplanet in a, in, at, say, Tau Ceti. And how would we know more about that planet, you know? And then we can, I could certainly imagine, you know, an accelerated program to send a probe on, on, on the, in the opposite direction to the focal, so, uh, solar focal region to see if we can get at least like an intermediate resolution image of that planet. Uh, if you're flying a mission to go look at one planet, because that you really need to be in that special position, yeah. are there targets of opportunity while you're there, or do you really need to use all of your observing time? To, to collect photons if, from that exoplanet. If that solar system has more than one target of interest, then you might be able to explore them. But by and large, the distances are so enormous that every mission is going to be target specific. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, you're talking about using a constellation possibly of observing craft at that solar focusing point, what if you could find two targets and then use the two different constellations to more precisely like triangulate their positions in space? Would uh, that help with precision? I doubt that. Good question, but I doubt that because again, the distances are so enormous that let's say, you know, you have two targets that are, let's say, one degree apart in the sky. Multiply that by 650 AU. How far will those two constellations be if they are one degree apart? 
So you're basically trying to do radio navigation from, or even optical navigation from that source. You might as well just try to DSN. So no, I don't think that's going to help because again, things are so big in the outer, outer solar system, so insanely, insanely big. You know, I use that sports field thing to try to illustrate that. I mean, now imagine a thousand of those sports fields and now you're trying to navigate, never mind the peppercorn, that's the moon. And we're talking about microscopic level of navigation, you know? Thank you very much. Thank you.